We turned on recording and we will be starting the meeting shortly. Thank you all for being here. Good morning. I'm not giving uh, the primary talk today, Jill says, but I'm trying to uh, model uh, good behavior. So this is uh, my llama color, Dharma colored uh, face mask. Uh, Sabrina found this at um, Target. So there's a shout out to Target. I don't know if they still have them. <laughs> I think it's really funny. Uh, so, but I need to know if people can hear me because the microphone seems really far away. So if you can, thumbs up, okay, that's good. Okay, good. So uh, as bodhisattvas, uh, we need to set a higher bar uh, for teaching and healing and uh, practice like that. Uh, so we've been very careful about opening the temple and the only people that would be here in the temple over the last four months are people cleaning up or flushing the toilets or uh, techno technicians helping put together this broadcast. So I want to thank the people that have shown up. When we start meeting again, we'll start meeting outdoors. Uh, and we have some guidelines for that. So we'd meet in a circle in the garden. Uh, and we have nice grass growing and we've been uh, pacing it off. So maybe eight, nine, 10 people, the maximum can meet outside in a circle. What do you think? I think that's a good idea. Yes, thumbs up. <clears throat> Uh, I'm very aware of the virus because I live with a nurse and some people who don't hang out with medical personnel um, go to either extreme, you know? Uh, so Sabina uh, doesn't go into the office. She's not seeing patients, but she um, uh, helps manage, case manage, uh, when people are discharged from Kaiser. There are so many people, mainly elderly people that are um, dying from this flu. So uh, I wanna emphasize that I'm 67 and some Sangha members are uh, older than I am and are living with uh, people older uh, who they need to take care of. So even when we feel younger and stronger, um, I'm aware that you know we come in contact with so many people. So, you know, we we do our best. I meet with people at Middleway Health, and uh, I have to sometimes meet with people, and it's okay if there's a lot of breeze. Sometimes I say we can talk with that mask on, but um, <clears throat> I know this still a risk, right? We, we have uh, uh, to acknowledge that we have risk, but we try to particularly at lines or uh, minimalize it. So even when we open up in person fully uh, at some point when there's a vaccine, uh, I hope to be able to continue doing 
these video broadcasts and uh, make it available for people that live out of town or uh, you know feel and, and need to uh, you know stay safe, right? So um, I'm very invested in getting the right technology and, and we're still working on that. And I'd like to thank people that uh, donated uh, and said, okay, here's some money, spend it on technology. <laughs> so uh, I'm really happy for that. I'd like to thank people for continuing. I met with uh, our new bookkeeper, Alexis, who not all of you have met yet. and. I said, uh, are we paying our bills or the donations and the support staying steady? And she said, yes. That's really quite a testament to everyone here, uh, their faith and dharma, their continuity of practice, um, that, that we're not, um, you know, we're, we're not behind in our, our paying our bills. So really appreciate that. Um, dharma centers are, uh, exist on donation only and uh, it's working. So uh, a shout out to all of you uh, Bodhisattvas there. Um, <clears throat> you can still hear me, okay? <laughs> like that. <clears throat> so uh, I want to turn the talk over uh, to Jules. Um, I, uh, when I've We've been meeting with uh, Hansa Remshe. Uh, uh, we've uh, become good friends. Uh, he um, very interested in uh, psychotherapy and uh, alternative approaches. He's very modern and uh, forward thinking. And uh, he wants to expand his Dharma activities. Uh, and he asked, well, who, who would be really helpful for that? So uh, I said, I think I know someone who would be very helpful to you. And that person is Jules. And that's uh, been the case. So uh, she journeyed to uh, Nepal. And she'll tell her story about what happened on the outside and uh, what happened on the inside, too. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Uh, and. I hope people have, there's enough time for questions too. Um, and it's really important for a presenter, um, as you know, to ask very difficult, challenging questions. Those are really appreciated. <laughs> just, <laughs> Jules is saying, no, 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 no. Just kidding, just kidding. No, no. <laughs> like that. All right, so uh, and we're still doing prayers, right? So. I'll bow out right now so I can, uh, I'll step up to uh, the shrine and do it. Oh, my horn, yay, peace. Okay, you yeah, are good. <laughs> you are good. You get to take off your mask. Okay. <laughs> Connor, is it muted? Uh, no, okay. All right. You need to turn off the sound. No, the sound. Just keep it off until I'm done. Okay. Teacher. Foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, 
Thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, nor of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, know over the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth and you said, I am supreme in the world. To you who were wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like a golden moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you who is free from dust. Matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, feel devotion like merits and good qualities, to the thus gone I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning, to the Dharma that brings peace I prostrate. For freedom, teaching the path, well abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage, to all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, and all aspects, with supreme faith I pay homage. Do not commit any non virtuous actions. Accumulate virtue and goodness, subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning, and clouds, look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, stirred by waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, May I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time, and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen, and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala together with other pure offerings of wealth and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O oh, my masters, my yidams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth waves of your blessings. Idam guru ratnam madalakam niratayami. The Heart of Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time, the Bhagavan was dwelling on massive vultuous mountain on Rajadriha, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. 
At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomenon called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avrakeshvara, looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then, through the power of the Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avrakeshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avrakeshvara said this to the Venerable Shari Putra. Shari Putra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage of the, should practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form, emptiness is not other than form, form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no eye element, and so on, and up to and including no mind element and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on and up to and including no aging and death and no extinction of aging and death. Therefore, then there's no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There's no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, complete awakening and reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequal, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth, since it's not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared, Dayata gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhi soha. Dayata gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhi soha. Tayata gate gate paragate parasangate bodhi soha. Shariputra, the bodhisattva, mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the bodhisattva, mahasattva, Arya, Avrakeshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son the lineage. It is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Shaivadi Putra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, Arya, Avrakeshvara, those surrounding their entirety along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. My home? Remember, your sound is off. Okay, so I should drop the sound. Well, your sound is off, so you can't hear anything. I just unmuted myself. Should I remute myself? Just you leave talk. it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, hello to those of you who don't know me. My name is Jules Jalab, and I have been a student of Lama Jimpa's for about two years. 
I want to start off by saying thank you to Lama for being here today and for giving that wonderful introduction, as well as to Connor, Matthew, and James for moderating and taking care of all the technology stuff today. So between December 2019 and up until March of this year, I was very graciously invited by the Venerable Kong Sir Rinpoche to travel to his monastery and to live at the institute he founded in Nepal. I was asked to come there to teach young child monks living there the English language, as well as to study the Dharma. Kong Sir Rinpoche is widely known around the world for being an incredible Vajrayana master, as well as for his innovative methods in teaching the Dharma. Among his many accomplishments, he is known for being a best-selling author in Taiwan. He established the Dipkar Foundation, which has so far provided over 110,000 meals, 110, meals to the poor in Vietnam. He travels around the world to give his Dharma teachings, and we are also very lucky to have him here at Lion's Roar. He continues to bless us with his teachings by providing um, remote teachings from his monastery in Nepal. And of course, you can check the Lion's Roar website to get information for his next teachings. He's also a tulku. And for those of you who don't know that, but what that means, a tulku is a reincarnated, em reincarnated emanation of a Buddhist master. So our current Dalai Lama is the 14th Dalai Lama, which means he's the 14th reincarnation of this lineage. This current Kong Sir Rinpoche is the eighth reincarnation. And his predecessor is one of the few great masters who actually is responsible for identifying our current Dalai Lama. Kong Sir Rinpoche founded the Tongkar Dechen Choling Monastic Institute about two years ago. Rinpoche founded this monastery to give orphaned and underprivileged young boys in Nepal the opportunity to learn the Dharma as well as to be fed and clothed and to be able to live in a warm home. Because Rinpoche had this idea to build the monastery and followed through on his action, there are now over 60 young boys who have been able to leave their lives of poverty behind and they are able to live in relative comfort and practice the Dharma's monastics. One boy named Godin was three years old when his father dropped him off with only a bag of instant ramen. His father was no longer able to care for him. His cheeks were sunken in for malnourishment and now one year later, he is thriving and happy. Two boys around 13 and 17, named uh, Mingmar and Tonglam, were picked up in the rural Nepali village after their older sister requested that they join the monastery because their parents died so many years ago and the sister could no longer support the growing boys. These are just examples of the children who I have gotten to know during my stay in Nepal. And these are children who have been directly benefited by Rinpoche's incredible feat of founding the monastery in 2018. And it goes to show you that whatever, whenever you have an idea that has the possibility to help others, you should pursue it because that action, it, you never know who it could end up helping. So my time at Tonkar Monastery was incredibly formative, not just as a, ta as a Dharma student, but as a human. My time over there has strengthened my bond with the Dharma, the Sangha and my gurus. So now I will share some of these experiences with you and I hope that they will provide insight into monastic life. And I hope that you can take something away from this talk that will help you around your own path. So the weeks leading up to my trip, I was just incredibly nervous. And I remember feeling so unworthy of having an opportunity like this. I would always think to myself like, why? Why me? There are so many smarter people out there, so many better practitioners. And for some reason, it was me who got this opportunity. There was someone who didn't believe that I deserved to go on this trip and they had made that very clear to me. So all of these negative feelings that I was battling inside myself just became so much more amplified. I worried so much before getting to Nepal up until the last few minutes as we were landing in Kathmandu and I just felt so anxious and I couldn't stop dwelling on my shortcomings. For all those countless hours I spent worrying, the second I stepped foot on the monastery grounds, I felt at home. I was surrounded by people who didn't speak the same language as me and who were completely different from me. I was the only woman even living at the monastery, which housed up about 80 men and boys. So there was really no logical reason as to why I felt so comfortable and calm. Upon reflection, I now realize why all of my negative feelings subsided so quickly. And that is because I had been overwhelmed with so much mutual respect, trust, and love by so many beings around me. Brick by brick, I put up a wall built of self-doubt and self-loathing, and each brick was removed by the love of another person. Lama took a piece of that wall away when he spent hours preparing with me and making sure I was ready for monastic life. My parents each took a part of that wall away when their fear for me taking this trip so far from home transformed into excitement and pride. 
And of course, so many Sangha members and cherished friends who smiled at me, who told me they were excited for me or who teased me by saying they were jealous of me. All of you took a piece of that wall away. Each of these wonderful people broke down a piece of that wall I built so rapidly. Once I realized how much positivity all of you have given me. Kindness is powerful, love is powerful, and Buddha nature is powerful. The value of each of your kindness and joy is truly a miracle, and the power of your action transcends time and space because your action is carried by another person in their hearts. So if you want to know what kind of a person Rinpoche is, I arrived in Nepal on New Year's Eve, and on that night, Rinpoche was just so incredibly kind, and he actually took me out to celebrate New Year's Eve with him and two of the other lamas residing at the monastery, even though that this isn't even really a holiday that they celebrate. We walked down the streets of Kathmandu, visiting shrines and seeing the street that Rinpoche's parents lived on when he was a child. We moved through the bustling streets of Kathmandu to have dinner at a restaurant, where Rinpoche ordered us um, traditional Nepali tali for dinner. For those of you that are unfamiliar, tali is traditional Nepali meal compromised of um, several small dishes and metal bowls. So as we enjoyed our food, I forked over a small bowl of greens of what I thought was a small cucumber. As Rinpoche was explaining my responsibilities as a monastery, I stuck the whole cucumber in my mouth. As I started chewing, I slowly realized that it wasn't a cucumber. It was actually the spiciest pepper I ever ate in my life. <laughs> so here I am, it's my first day in Nepal, and I'm sitting across from one of the greatest Buddhist masters in our age, having New Year's Eve dinner, and I'm dying of like a capsaicin overdose. Like it was bad. And I can handle my spice, but this was like different. I was trying to pay attention to him as I slowly like was trying to think about how I can get rid of this like burning inferno in my mouth in the most inconspicuous way possible. So I decided against spitting into my napkin because that just wouldn't be classy. So I swallowed the whole thing. <laughs> the spice level just kept getting worse and worse as I was sitting at the table and Rinpoche was telling me about how I would be helping some of the teachers with technology and things like that. And then the tears just start flowing and he's looking at me surprised. And I'm just like, I'm not crying because you're telling me I have work to do. I'm crying because I'm literally dying of like, there's burning hell in my mouth right now. I can't do anything about this. So the llamas and Rinpoche, they start laughing and Rinpoche asked me like, why didn't you spit it out? Like, why would you, why would you swallow this? So I told him like, I'm, I'm just trying to be polite. Like, I'm sorry. So Rinpoche then asked me what pepper I ate. And I pointed to the one on his plate. He then took his fork and proceeded to actually eat the chili pepper that I had eaten. So I wouldn't be the only one suffering because the gates of hell just happened to open up in my mouth. You know, he started, he, through our like laughter, he started tearing up as well. And he said that he, he never ate a chili pepper that spicy in his life. And it's, while it is really funny to look back on, I think it really says a lot about Rinpoche's character. His reaction when he saw how nervous and embarrassed I was because I ate the chili pepper by mistake, he, he decided to kind of inflict that pain on himself so I wouldn't be the only person sitting at the table going through that. And his kindness and humor, they go hand in hand with wisdom and compassion. That's just the type of person he is. So while adjusting to monastic life was quite easy for me, um, there are many luxuries which are not there. So for instance, I had to wash all of my clothes by hand for three months in the blistering winter cold. I lived in a private room in a dormitory with other students and teachers, but I woke up every morning at 5 a.m. to the students going, Omara Patsana di 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 di, and just like screaming it at the top of their lungs. Um, a lot of the time I didn't have access to Wi-Fi, so I couldn't contact others back home. But quite honestly, none of that stuff really mattered to me. Um, I know that there are some people who might find facing these things kind of difficult, but those small luxuries that we're used to, they're just luxuries. It's not important to decide how we live our lives. Um, it's, and it's important to know that this is not how most of the world lives. So when we encounter something that feels difficult when we travel, it's important to remember that this is in fact the norm. Something, however, that did prove to be an adjustment to me was the fact that I was the only Western woman living at the mon monastery with so many monks and children who were very shy around me and it took some time for us to find our footing and to build a relationship together. When I first saw all these small children dressed in those red monastic clothing behaving so quietly and politely, I was in awe. It just looked like something out of a movie. 
these kids, they just seemed so enlightened and sweet and just beautiful people. And I compared them to kids back home and seeing them from an emotional distance, they seemed so serene. As I started teaching English to them, they were really, really shy and very nervous to speak with me. I was a stranger. I was the only young woman living at the monastery that they had seen for many months. And I was definitely the first woman who even lived at the monastery for an extended period. Um, it must have been a difficult adjustment for them to accept me as their teacher. To be strict with them and to try to teach them proper grammar in a traditional academic setting would have been fruitless. So I decided the best way to get them comfortable with speaking English would be to balance learning proper grammar and pronunciation mixed with playing games and watching some movies. Appealing to them in this playful manner was successful and they quickly wanted to participate in class. Slowly, I began to learn about their individual personalities. Some kids were sweet, some were mischievous, some were gifted but preferred playing. Some were funny, some were awkward, some were studious, but they were all just kids. They were no different from the kids growing up here in the US. Looking back, I do feel a little bit silly that I made the judgment so quickly because somehow wearing red robes makes them more special and believing that they were somehow different from other kids. And this is pretty predominant, especially on the last night of my trip when a 14 year old boy named Farchin asked me when I was leaving. I told him I was leaving tomorrow and his face looked so sad. I tried to joke with him and say, oh, Farchin, are you happy I'm leaving tomorrow? He somberly replied, no miss. I'm sad, I'm so sad. I felt so touched up until a few moments later when he turned his face up at me and said, Miss, can I have your iPad when you go home? Yeah. <laughs> In all seriousness though, the bonds we cultivated together were built slowly over time, but they became strong. At first, when, we would circumbobulate, when I would circumbobulate the temple and do my walking meditation, the kids would look at me curiously through the windows or turn away. As we got to know each other, however, they became more comfortable playing with me. And whenever they saw me walking alone during their free time, they would catch up to me and either do mantras with me or they would ask me to practice English with them. We would walk together for hours and just talk. I would listen to them tease each other. We would race each other. Sometimes we'd play tennis or chess. And you know, when Rinpoche asked me to come to Nepal to teach these kids English, in return, they gave me so much love and warmth. And while we may be from different parts of the world approaching each other with kindness, humor and lightheartedness allowed us to share an unconditional bond. One particular moment I'd like to share with you is that one day I brought my bag full of prayer books with lines for a logo and photograph on the back, as well as the framed pictures of Lama Lan Geshla. I let them rummage through my bag. And when they saw the picture of our own lines for a temple on the back of the prayer books, they became so excited. They asked me if this was my temple back home. I told them that it was, and they proceeded to share the prayer books with each other and comment on the temple. A young boy named Tarpa pulled out the pictures of Lamala and Geshla from my bag and immediately started laughing hysterically when he saw the picture of Lamala. He said, miss, miss, this is a foreign man. Why is he dressed like a monk? He's white like you. I laughed along and I explained to him that this was our Dharma teacher back home and that he used to be a monk. While they did change and become more respectful and understanding, they still thought it was pretty hilarious that someone who didn't look like them was also wearing monastic clothing. As Tarpa looked at the picture of Geshla, he said, Miss, Miss, this is Nepali man. He's like us. I laughed and said, he's not like you. He's foreign to you. Geshla's from Mongolia. He's a Mongolian man, Tarpa replied. Nah, I think he looks like a Nepali man. He doesn't look Mongolian. <laughs> when I explained to him that this man was in fact her Geshla, the kids became vi visibly impressed. They each passed the photograph of Geshla to each other, examining it quietly. They understand how much hard work goes into becoming a Geshla, how many years of studying, memorizing, theorizing, and debate goes into earning the title of Geshe. It's a dream for many of these young monks to, be, to earn the title of Geshe, and the respect they had for him was apparent from their reaction. Many, if not most, of these children grew up without a formal education. Rinpoche's monastery was only established about two years ago, and for the few 18-year-old boys there, their education started at 16. Rinpoche founded the monastery not only with the intent to educate these young monks, the highest standard of learning the Dharma, but also for them to have traditional formal education. And this is very different from most of the monastic schools around the world. Most of the monastic schools only provide Dharma education so the students can become monks and they can proceed without education. 
Rinpoche makes sure that they take math, English, science, Nepali, Tibetan, and English along with their Dharma coursework. So they will be able to graduate with a high school diploma as well as with their um, Dharma degree. So their relationship with education is actually quite admirable. Some of the younger students who are under nine years old, you know, some are silly and they don't really want to study so much, but the kids that are around, you know, let's say over the age of 10, 11, they actually understand the privilege that they have with this opportunity. And they're all extremely studious actually, because thanks to Rinpoche, they now have the opportunity to have this education. And it's not something that would have been available to them before. Seeing this, it becomes very apparent how blessed we all are to have the privilege of a formal education. We can learn new things off the internet. We can read books so leisurely and education is just not a privilege many people receive. During my three months in Nepal, Rinpoche was so incredibly generous with his time with me. We would go to the city together and he would show me some beautiful architecture and Buddhist monuments. He would discuss the Dharma with me, but some of his most profound teachings came from watching his interactions with others. During my first week in Nepal, we were walking from a Shakyamuni shrine in Kathmandu when Rinpoche stopped near an elderly street peddler with a scale. He struck a conversation with the peddler in Nepali and laughed with him. He then paid him a few rupees and got on the scale to check his weight. Initially, I thought this was a bit silly to pay a street peddler some money to check your weight. But as I put that judgment aside, I noticed that the man's shoes and clothing were worn. His hands were calloused and he was visibly exhausted. Still, he smiled at Rinpoche and held conversation with him for a few minutes. After Rinpoche said goodbye to him, he turned to me and told me that those street peddlers often spend their days outside because they need to earn a small amount of money to feed their families or themselves. They do not have jobs and this is their only means of survival. Now I think about all those other people who are less fortunate than I am and how I passed them on the street without a second thought or even the homeless men and women who I passed a few bills to outside of the crack to the window in my car. Rinpoche proceeded to give money to these poor peddlers nearly every time we left the monastery together, but he never just handed them a few bucks and walked past them. He always stopped and he spoke with them for just a few moments even. It was just Rinpoche and that person who he was speaking to. He treated that person with respect, with humor, and as if he was treating them speaking with an old friend. Many of us can do the bare minimum and spare a change to give uh, someone some money who's hungry, but we must go further and take the step to show the person who we are helping the respect that they deserve and to treat them as our genuine equal and not as someone who should be treated with fear or even with pity. Compassion goes beyond charity. Compassion is taking your time to truly connect with another person. Towards the last uh, four weeks of my trip, Rinpoche directed me to go on a solitary retreat. We initially planned to go into seclusion away from the monastery, but the coronavirus fears were picking up and for safety reasons, we just decided to proceed the retreat at the monastery. Rinpoche instructed me to turn off all of my electronics, not to watch any TV shows, do any reading or listen to music. I was not allowed to communicate with anyone and even doing things such as cleaning or picking up a cup they must be done with absolute mindfulness. He told me that even when you pick up a cup, you can't do this on autopilot. You must think about your action with absolute mindfulness. The only person I could contact this time was Rinpoche and only for discussing Dharma questions that came up during meditation. I was not allowed to interact with any of the other children at this time. Meals were taken in my room alone and in silence. The first day of my retreat, I noticed so many distractions that came into my mind. Thoughts of the past, of people who hurt me, feelings of regret, of anger, and of sadness. I took note of all these feelings and thoughts, and I approached Rinpoche the next day. He then instructed me to conduct an analytical meditation session, which involved finding the positives of each person who hurt me. The most constructive and transformative method of this was to write everything down on paper. As I wrote the positive qualities of each person, I felt myself becoming lighter. With each stroke of my pen, I learned to forgive myself for harboring negative feelings which obscured my Buddha nature. 
I was not directly harmed by the pain that was inflicted from another person, but it was the negativity which I carried from that experience, which was the direct harm for my piece. During this time, we are dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. We are all struggling with our mental health and spending so much time alone with ourselves. Even if you find yourselves with your families, there's still that sense of isolation. During this time, if you are struggling with periods of depression or negativity, or even if you notice yourself having flashbacks of remembering bad times in your life, I encourage you to sit alone with yourself and to examine the truth of the situation. The tr truth is you are not being harmed in this direct moment. If you find yourself quarantining alone, I hope you spend time with yourself without any distractions, no form of media or activity whatsoever. And that during this time, you can take accountability for the thoughts that come into your mind. Reflect on what thoughts influence you when you are alone. Any negative thought you have about another person or about yourself, take note of it, realize it, acknowledge it, and then transform it into a positive. The, this is the easiest way you can transform yourself to become a more peaceful person who lives in the present. So later in my solitary retreat, Rinpoche asked me what animal I feared most in the world. I told him that it was a crocodile. We both share a deep-rooted fear of crocodiles. Rinpoche explained to me that in his childhood, after he was recognized as a tulku, his master took him to the zoo and had him meditate on the crocodile and bless it with mantras. The next step in my retreat was to practice analytical meditation on a crocodile and then to select a person who I have deep-seated uh, deep feelings of hate for and meditate on both. So my next day of meditation, I had to meditate on a crocodile and on Jeffrey Epstein. So people have this idea that when you're meditating or when you're on a retreat, it means you're like all peaceful and Zen and you know, you're just sitting there happy. No, it's not. It's not blissful to meditate on a pedophile and on a vicious predator. So as I sat and I meditated, initially I was like filled with these feelings of repulsion repulsion towards crocodiles for how viciously they kill our prey, and repulsion towards Jeffrey Epstein for all the harm and pain he caused so many people for his own pleasure. However, the more and more I meditated on this, the more feelings of sympathy I had. The crocodile kills in such a way because it is in his nature to kill in that way. The crocodile has no choice because it is his own karma that gave him such a rebirth. Like the crocodile, we are helpless in who we are born as, and this is why the human life is so precious. We have the capability to create positive karma and choice. Like Shanti Davis said in his book, The Bodhisattva Way of Life, like a blind beggar who happens to find a rare jewel in a pile of rubbish, we are lucky to be born in this life and to find the Dharma. Focusing my meditation on Jeffrey Epstein, I realized that his human life was wasted because he caused so much harm to others. And like that, we, can, we also cannot waste our short time on this earth. Regardless of the harm a person, an animal, or any other sentient being causes today, we cannot lose faith that in their future lives, they will have the power to be positive beings. In the same vein, we cannot forget how blessed we are to have this life today because we have undoubtedly caused so much harm to others in our past lives. Whatever you hate or fear most in this world today, you should recognize that in a past life, it's completely possible that you embodied exactly what you dislike at this very moment. This is why Tantra is so important. We can live our lives blindly and happily in ignorant bliss, but it is much more powerful and effective to truly and deeply examine the negative feelings we experience, which are brought alive so easily with just a little bit of prodding. One of the other more profound experiences of my trip is that during the first week of February, Rinpoche held a week-long retreat for his students. So we had about 80 visitors coming from Taiwan, Mongolia, and Vietnam. All of the staff and students went through so much preparation to have so many visitors coming. And even when they were there, there was this sense of anxiety because the coronavirus um, was just picking up. And at the time, we still didn't really know anything about it. So we all try to be as careful as possible and Rinpoche had everyone wearing face masks, even as they meditated for hours. And Rinpoche really did display an elegant sense of concern for others, even while myself and other people around him uh, kind of just downplayed the whole thing. 
Rinpoche always made sure that we were taking the correct precautions and he really took on a sense of compassion and concern on behalf of all of our well-being, which to this day I found, find so inspiring. I remember even myself, um, one day Rinpoche was telling me how the coronavirus was picking up and how he believed it potentially could affect the whole world. And I was just kind of like, oh, the media over sensationalizes everything. Uh, we had swine flu, we had SARS and never got that bad, you know, whatever, it'll, it'll be fine. So instead of arguing with me, Rinpoche just smiled and he laughed and he said, oh, well, I hope, I hope you're right. And he just made sure that I wore a mask and everyone around him wore a mask and we took the right precautions. So he was able to communicate his point in a nonverbal way and time, of course, proved Rinpoche right and myself wrong. To use skillful means like that is a very effective way to communicate with others. With everything Rinpoche does or says, there's always a very inspiring sense of humility where he doesn't feel the need to prove himself right. He really just behaves in the way of a true Buddha. The participants of the retreat themselves were also incredibly generous, good-natured and accomplished people. They approached me with such kindness and open-heartedness and it really reminded me of our own lines or Sangha here in Sacramento. They approached me without labels and without any sense of ego. And it really surprised me later on to hear about the accomplishments of so many people. One man is a professor of physics at USC. One woman is a Harvard educated attorney who is now a high ranking government official with the Vietnamese government. And someone, there was one woman who was professor at Harvard Law School. And the people who I connected with there, they didn't approach me with their titles or behave as they were as if they were from a different social class than I was. They knew nothing about me, but they approached me as a Sangha member. The man who is a professor of physics at USC, his name is Mr. Chow, and he actually came to class with me on his last day at the retreat to help me teach the older students. He treated the students with so much love and care, despite the fact that it was his first time meeting them. He would ask them questions in English, and I watched them respond and maintain a conversation with him. And I saw how confident they felt with their language skills and as their teacher, it filled me with such pride and happiness. Mr. Chow praised them and told them that if they study hard, the whole world will be open to them and how one day they could even be able to travel to America and meet us there. I looked at the boys and I felt this overwhelming sense of community. I told them, there are Sangha members who love and support you and you haven't even met them yet. At that moment, it really got through to me that Sangha is not just the people who attend temple with you. The Lions Roar Sangha is not just limited to those who attend the Sacramento Dharma Center. It reaches the ends of the earth. We have an immediate connection with Dharma practitioners all over the world. I've only met a small fraction of these people during the retreat, and maybe you haven't met them yet, but I guarantee you there are Dharma practitioners who may not speak your language, but they still love you and care for you based on the bonds of our practice. I knew as I was living it that this was the happiest time of my life. While I was sad about leaving, it never felt like the end of a trip or an experience or anything like that. I cried on my last day with the children, not because I didn't think I would never see them again, but I cried because I didn't want them to grow up, grow up too much without me. When I went to give my last kata and formally say goodbye to Rinpoche, I also presented him with a card for which I wrote my gratitude for him because I knew it wouldn't be possible for me to verbalize it. Sure enough, as soon as I opened my mouth to say thank you, I started bawling. Rinpoche just laughed and wrapped a cot around my neck and told me that we would see each other again soon. And if I ever needed him day or night to just call him and he would always pick up the phone right away. There are no words for the immense sense of gratitude that I feel for this day. There is no way I can ever repay Lama and Geshla for their teachings and for how they prepared for me to take this trip to Lamala for telling Rinpoche about me. And there is no way I can repay Rinpoche for the magnitude of his kindness and his trust for me and for all that I learned from him. Lamala, Geshla, and Rinpoche are some of the greatest masters a person can ever imagine. If you listen to them, and I mean really listen to them, not just with your ears, but with your heart mind, you will realize if you haven't realized it already that every single action and every single word is a teaching. The only feasible way we can start to pay back these beautiful masters who so generously give us their time is to dedicate ourselves as students. It doesn't mean just being scholars and memorizing facts. 
It doesn't mean buying expensive statues or offering bowls to put on your altar. To be a dedicated Dharma student, it means you rise to the challenge of living life every day. It means you consider every action you take. It means holding yourself accountable for each time you engage with another being. It means you push yourself to be compassionate when it is so easy not to be. And it means you recognize the struggle of truly dedicating yourself, of moving against samsara's current and to attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. So I would like to open the floor now for any questions or if Lama has any comments or anything you'd like to say. Thank yeah, you so thank much. You. Thank yeah. you, Lama. Please take some questions. Okay, Great. perfect. Mm -hmm. There's a number of comments and yeah. Okay. Did you want to show pictures? Oh, sure. Let's show some pictures. Oh, thank you so much, Marie. Oh. Okay. Okay, so Susan Farrar is asking me, are you in contact with the monks now? So I still, um, I'm in contact with the teachers there and I still speak with Rinpoche. Um, actually, they don't really have too much internet access over there. So I get pictures of them and things like that. But in terms of actually talking with the children, I, I don't really have access to that. So this is a picture of um, the young boy Tarpa who pulled out the picture of Geshela and he was too shy to take a picture of himself with it. So. Is him hiding behind the picture of Geshla. Can we pull up more of the pictures? Oh, can I just scroll through them or? Uh, I've got a quick comment. Okay, so if you can see, this boy De Young is holding the pictures of the prayer books in his hand, and this is our Lions or logo on the back. So they were just so excited just to pull it out and look through them. And there's a boy to the left who's just looking at the picture of Lamalo with um, in his monastic clothing. He's just so excited. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for the wonderful comments, you guys. If you, if anyone has a question, please feel free to unmute yourself and uh, turn your video on, and I'd be happy to answer them. But thank you so much for the support. So I see Elizabeth Wadsworth is asking, are you planning to do anything like this in the future? Um, I definitely am. Rinpoche and I have definitely talked about coming, like me coming back, hopefully once the pandemic is over, and continuing to work with the kids and things like that. And um, Rinpoche, he, he has plans in the future to open up a dip car branch in the US. So we also have talks about that. And it's quite exciting. You know, there's there's a lot of plans for the future. Yeah. Oh, so this is the first day. They actually opened. They're still under construction since it's a relatively new monastery. And they just uh, finished construction on a cafe there. So Rinpoche, he actually had these ID cards made. And here he is placing them on the student. Um, so the ID cards, he actually puts about 200 rupees on each card um, each month so the kids can go to the cafe and they can buy themselves coffee and tea and snacks, whatever they want, and just uh, be able to sit there and socialize. So it's it's very kind and very sweet. So, And it's a really gorgeous, gorgeous uh, monastery. It's actually facing um, the Manjushri Temple Stupa, and it's, it's really beautiful. Yeah. Let's keep going through. Oh, yeah, so this is a picture of the kids holding the, um, I can't see the poster exactly, but this picture of Lamal and Geshla there. I actually made them stand and pose with it. <laughs> yeah. He's holding a medicine Buddha. Oh, that's medicine Buddha? <laughs> oh, yeah. They like to take selfies on my phone. <laughs> I have a lot of selfies with them on my phone, so <laughs> yeah, they're cute ones. <laughs> so is that all the pictures I sent? Okay, perfect. Ellen Wolf. Okay. So Ellen is asking, how did your trip shape your education plans to be a lawyer? Um, that's a really interesting question, Ellen. Let me think about that for a second. So it, it definitely learned to be much more, like, I learned to be a much more flexible person, I would say so. Um, you know, this this didn't really happen so much with the kids, but Rinpoche, he really um, seemed encouraging of me taking the path to become um, a public defender. 
because he, he really believes that everyone deserves compassion in their lives, no matter what they've done. So speaking with him before, I used to kind of be fearful about, you know, defending, you know, people who've done something wrong like this, but um, being on that solitary retreat and having to meditate on the negative feelings I have for each other, it, it really, really changed my outlook on others, even, even if they did something bad or something really um, harmful to someone else, you can still have sympathy for that person. And I know maybe some, for some of you, it's really hard to believe that you can have sympathy for others who cause harm, but it is possible. It really is possible if you do enough soul searching and if you do enough self-reflection, you can gain that sympathy. It is true. So I would say that's what, what changed my perspective the most. And I, I really do think that definitely changed the course of my education in terms of wanting to be a lawyer. Yeah. Thank you so much for the question, Ellen. Oh, thank you so much for the wonderful comments, you guys. I really appreciate it. Okay, if anyone else has a question, um, feel free to ask or if Lamo wants to say anything. No, it's just perfect. Okay. You can have the last word. Okay, well, um, if no one has any more questions, I'll just want to say thank you so much for coming and listening in. Oh, sorry. Oh, Mary asked me a question. Do you find yourself sticking to the same habits that you adjusted to in Nepal? Thank you, Miriam. Um, <laughs> uh, definitely when I first came back, I stuck with the schedule of waking up super early in the morning, uh, doing my practice and um, just kind of maintaining that structure. And of course, you know, adjusting to American life, it's, it's pretty different, you know? So a lot of the structure has, has stayed. I still wake up early in the morning. I still do my practice every day. Um, but more so, I don't think um, the same habits matter so much as, as much as the outlook for life. So while I don't stick to like the identical, like I'm going to wake up at 5 a.m. every morning like I did at the monastery and have tea time at 4, you know, that, that stuff hasn't stuck. But um, my outlook has changed on a lot of things and my relationship with, all, with everyone in my life has transformed so much. So I would say that that has stuck with me the most since I, come, I came back. Yeah. Okay. Um, any more questions before I sign off? Okay. We're good? Yeah, okay. Good. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I hope this talk was good, but thank you so much for the wonderful comments. I really appreciate it. And um, now Connor will be doing the dedication. So thank you so much to everyone. So can you mute? Of course I can. Turn off your sign off. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Okay, so on to dedication. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain a state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chen Rezi, Tenzin Jatsu, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the beholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Loso, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of this stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avrilu Keshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Hello, Sang Drapa. I make requests at your holy feet. All right. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, we'll see you hopefully you soon. Tomorrow night is uh, Lamala's Teaching Buddha, Buddha Dharma Study Program and uh, 84 Mahasiddhas. Um, I don't know what else we have coming up this week. Interesting things are coming up this week. So check the calendar, check the roar. Um, and we will see you all soon. Yeah, uh, 
thank you all for the donations that you have been making. Um, you guys can always make more donations if you'd like. Um, every moment, every uh, cent counts. Um, we are a donation-based organization. Um, if you go online uh, to uh, lionsroydharmacenter.org, there's a donation page where you can make donations online. Um, and we're going to try to you know, hopefully uh, do some interesting things coming up with the technology to have uh, both in-person and online things at the same time as we start opening up in the future. Hopefully opening up uh, outside in the garden soon. Um, so to be able to do that and have the technology to do that, we do need some extra support. Um, but hopefully we'll see you soon um, uh, in the garden. Uh, <laughs> we don't know when, but you know, soon. So, bye. Thanks for coming, and uh, thank you, Jules, for a wonderful talk. That was wonderful. It's great to hear about uh, what you did in uh, Nepal. Thank you. Happy birthday, uh, Honor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.